Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar. My name is Ian Quayle from IQ Legal Training. I'm delighted to be working with my friends at Stuart Title to uh, introduce you to a new series of webinars. And the first one today is we're looking at acting for sellers and we've talked and entitled the work 10 Good Habits when acting for sellers. But the reality is that there are a number of good habits, far more than 10, that I want to share with you today. The purpose of today's webinar is to sort of heighten awareness with regard to what is good practice when acting for sellers and of course to look at issues with regard to title indemnity insurance in connection with the conveyancing process and how it impacts or can impact on the work that we do when acting for sellers. So I'm delighted that I've got Robert Kelly from Stuart Title along with me today to assist with regard to some of the title indemnity issues that we'll be exploring. The first thing that we need to talk about today are issues in connection with onboarding the client seller. And I can't emphasize enough how important it is to make sure that we verify our client's identity before we do anything. And to do that, we can use electronic verification systems. We can use the old tried and tested methods of getting documentation from the client to verify ID, but there are two important points to make. Firstly, it is not enough simply to gather information and put it on file. It is necessary to at very least attempt to show that we've utilized the information to sort of cross-check the data and information that's been provided by the client or which has been provided by a verification service and significantly, just because we've verified client ID when we've been put on board at client, doesn't mean that we can then forget about fraud or property fraud related issues as the transaction progresses. Seller identity fraud has been an issue and will continue to be an issue. And the problem with seller identity fraud is either the seller's conveyancer or the buyer's conveyancer or both are going to take a hit if a buyer takes a hit as a consequence of uh, someone impersonating the lawful title owner. So this issue about verifying ID is very important. When we've downloaded official copies of the register, we can see our client seller's addresses for service, and we should check that there is a connection between the seller and their contact details that they've provided to us, as against the addresses for service that they've provided to the land registry. Historically, sellers have, uh, have as buyers, simply placed on the um, title one address for service. The land registry for many years now have permitted up to three addresses for service and I advocate that our clients use an email address as an address for service at the land registry so that if adverse possession claims, the risk of fraud, notices are placed on the title, the land registry has an easy and swift point of contact for the client. But for our purposes today, Good habit number one, the moment we've downloaded official copies of the register, we've cross-checked client contact details with addresses for service at the land registry. What's the position if the client's uh, address for service at the land registry doesn't tie in with what we've got on our file? Well, that's not an indicator that our client is a fraudster. There may be a perfectly legitimate reason as to why the two addresses are not the same or there are different email addresses, but we need to challenge the client and find out what the position is. And as I say, I'd far rather do that at the start of the transaction, clarify the position, or advise the client that we can't act on the basis that there are too many suspicious issues arising right at the start, than find ourselves in the position that lawyers have found themselves in with regard to seller identity fraud and buyer sustaining loss thereafter. As a seller, I would want to ask my client about their objective. Why are they selling this property? And again, there are certain reasons why a client that would, would be selling a property that might send alarm bells ring. Let's just go through them quickly. Client in financial difficulties. So I'm selling because I've got to. I've got to pump money into the business or I've got lots of creditors that I need to discharge or I've got HMRC chasing me. In those circumstances, the obvious thing to do is to make sure we ascertain 
what those liabilities are to make sure there's sufficient proceeds of sale to discharge them, or again, extract ourselves from the transaction right at the start. Again, nothing worse than acting for a client and finding later on in the life of the transaction that there's a problem, meaning that the transaction can't complete as there's going to be insufficient monies to discharge charges, or having to ask a seller client to put money in to client account to meet the shortfall. I'd rather know about the problem from the outset to be able to deal with it and manage it. So identification of client objective, even on a sale, in my view, is important. And then finally, the explanation of the transaction and our role within the transaction. Even on a sale, I think it's important we do that. Now, you may well turn around and say, well, hang on a minute. We, clearly, the client bought the property and therefore understands the conveyancing process. I think that assumption is dangerous. So I do think it's important that we explain to the client the process that's involved in their duties and obligations as the transaction progresses. Of course, that depends on the client, depends on their expertise and knowledge and experience. But again, just bear that in mind, please, at the start of the transaction. As far as client identification is concerned, as I mentioned on the slide, we should be looking at electronic verification. If we are utilizing electronic verification, can we please make sure that we have evidence that our verification system has been audited and that we're confident that the system that we're using is safe, secure, and fit for purpose? That's not really a job for you as a transactional property lawyer, but it's something that you need to check up on and just make sure that there is evidence as to the systems that you're using and that they're robust enough for the purpose that you're using them for. If we're using documentary uh, evidence to support client identity, then double check documents. If a client produces a passport for you, it's a recent passport, can I see the old one? Again, check out addresses, check out telephone numbers, etc., and make a note on file that you've undertaken that exercise, just in case someone comes back at a later date and challenges or challenges you or asks you what you did to verify ID. As I mentioned to practitioners on a fairly constant basis these days, you're not expected to be MI5, but you are expected to check and challenge clients, and that check and challenge occurs throughout the transaction. So question and challenge, as I mentioned on slide, I think is important. And do consider the client's state of play relating to the transaction and with relating to title. We're going to talk about this in a lot of detail in a moment or two. I'm going to bring Robert into this discussion. But certainly the issue of a defect in title and the identification of a defect in title would warrant an explanation to our seller client about the problem, uh, would warrant getting authority from the client to disclose the problem to the buyer's conveyancer, and perhaps to undertake some work relating to insurance and title indemnity insurance as a preliminary, so that we're not saying to the buyer, we've got a problem, we're gonna be saying to the buyer's conveyancer, there is a problem, there is a solution and there is a title indemnity policy sitting there that you can obtain that will alleviate that problem. And by the way, we've checked and we've identified what the premium is. Not for the life of me saying the seller takes out the policy far from it. And we'll discuss this with Robert also in a moment or two. I am saying that it might be useful for the seller to undertake some research with regard to the defect, to undertake some research with regard to availability of policy so that we're not just saying to a prospective buyer, we have some bad news, we're saying there is an issue, but there is also a solution. When acting for a seller, of course, we've got to draft the contract. And as far as the contract is concerned, there are one or two points that I want to share. Point number one, conveyancing protocol, requires us in a residential transaction to utilise the standard conditions of sale fifth edition. Be careful with mixed-use properties on the basis that we may be relying on commercial conditions of sale, or again with mixed-use, we might be using standard residential conditions of sale in their fifth edition, but then adding a lot of special conditions given the nature of the mixed-use transaction that we're acting for. Be careful in particular with auction conditions of sale and 
be particularly careful with online auction conditions for sale. It's a topic in its own right, an online auction, but one of the things that worries me when you look at online auction conditions is that the online auction house has been quite cute in shifting responsibility for any errors that are made with regard to describing the property or any issues of title relating to the property back to the seller rather than remaining with the auction house. So if the auction house makes a mistake, generally speaking, it is the, sellers, the seller that's going to take the hit or it's going to take the claim. The other point with regard to online auctions is there's two types of online auction. One, where you have, in essence, the highest bidder being then in a position to proceed towards a standard exchange of contract and completion, facilitating time for due diligence, as opposed to another type of uh, online auction where the highest bidder, in being the highest bidder, exchanges at the point that they are the highest bidder at the end of the auction. So you need to be careful from a seller's perspective as to what the online auction conditions have to say and just be aware of which conditions of sale are likely to apply to the transaction. I'm going to talk for a little bit about sales apart later in my presentation, but just be aware of the fact that if we are drafting a contract on a sale apart, there are additional issues that we need to think about and deal with during the preparation of the contract. On slide, I talk about disclosure of encumbrances. I'm going to do, delve into a little more detail in connection with encumbrances in a moment or two and to highlight the fact that it is necessary for a seller's conveyancer to identify patent encumbrances and latent encumbrances and to focus heavily on latent encumbrances and what we do and what we need to do with regard to them. Finally, on this slide, I talk about the incorporation of special conditions. Point number one, conveyancing protocol advocates that we don't insert special conditions into a residential contract unless the transaction is sufficiently peculiar to warrant it or we get specific instructions from our client that special conditions should be added. The uh, principle sitting behind the conveyancing protocol is that we shouldn't be adding special conditions in a standard residential sale. The seller's duty of disclosure is interesting. And again, we've got to be careful about what we say to clients. I'm conscious of the fact that we, when acting for a seller or buyer, can be bombarding clients with information about the conveyancing process. And the purpose is to protect our firm and ourselves rather than driving deals forward. But the seller's duty of disclosure, I think, is important. And it's imperative that the client understands what that is. Remember that one of the big issues with regard to negligence claims against conveyances at the moment is a failure to transmit information to the client so the client understands their duties and responsibilities. So if we were talking about acting for a seller or a buyer 10, 15 years ago, we might be looking at the majority of negligence claims arising from procedural errors. These days, what we're seeing is a vast number of claims relating to a failure to advise clients about their position, about documentation, or about the conveyancing process. So on this slide, we talk about the seller's duty of disclosure. And the first thing I talk about is the issue of answering TA forms and how we deal with TA forms when acting for a seller. And here I've got some good news. For acting for a seller, you provide your client with the TA forms and ask the client to answer them as honestly as possible. There isn't any expectation that the client seeks advice from you as to the questions or indeed their answers. Your role is simply to say to the client, answer the questions as honestly as you can. My role is simply to check what you've said against the information that I hold on my file. The advice to the client is complete them as fully as possibly, as honestly as possibly, make sure that if any of your answers change after you provide them to me in the TA forms, that you tell me about the change and I am on a bound then to tell the bias conveyancer of the change in reply. If you've got a client that you don't trust, you can mention section two of the Ford Act 2006 and say the client commits a criminal offense if they lie or fail to tell the correct position in reply to a question within the TA forms. 
there isn't any duty or obligation to disclose latent defects. Sorry, there is a duty and obligation to disclose latent defects. There isn't a duty to disclose patent defects or patent encumbrances. Again, we'll talk about this in some more detail in a moment or two. So, in connection with the replies to the questions in the TA forms, the point is this. Seller answers them as honestly as they can without any advice or assistance from conveyancer. Conveyancer checks the replies against the information that they hold on file. Where a response is known to be incorrect, the client should be uh, told and the issue remedied. So the correct answer provided. With regard to form TA-10 and the uh, situation with regard to fixtures, fittings and contents, where there are contents that are to be included in the sale, and the purchase price is being apportioned within the contract as a consequence, it is imperative that the seller client is aware that if that apportionment is unreasonable or unrealistic, and the buyer is able to seek a reduction in SDLT liability as a consequence, then there are significant consequences for all involved. Buyer's conveyance, a party to fraud in submitting an SDLT return. Buyer, party to fraud and deriving benefit as a consequence of reduced SDLT liability. Seller's conveyance, a party to fraud in drafting a contract, drafting an instrument that facilitates fraud against HMRC and seller, a participant too. So the TA forms and what is contained or relayed in the TA forms need to be checked where there is a price apportionment and an SDLT reduction, the seller's conveyancer should be asking their client or seeking some form of independent verification as to the price that's being paid for contents, thus legitimizing the apportionment in the contract. So TA forms don't cause too much problem in the conveyancing process at a, a sort of claims level. At a practical level, they do because your clients are going to badger you and pester you on the basis that they don't understand some of the questions or they need some hand-holding with regard to the questions. And the point I would make here is, if you are providing your client with any form of assistance, at the end of the day, the client is told that the replies in the TA forms are the client's own replies, and if the replies are defective, the client will be vulnerable for misrepresentation. In the last slide, we discussed issues in connection with patent and patent defects. And let me make the position quite clear. A patent defect is a defect that's obvious on an inspection of the title or obvious on an inspection of the property. And there is no obligation on a seller's lawyer to disclose a patent defect. That said, as we'll see in a moment or two, I think it would be wise to make a disclosure so that the other side is not caught unawares or the other side doesn't make a mistake and misses a patent defect and acquires a property leading to problems thereafter. But with regard to latent defects, there are a number of issues that I think are significant and that a conveyancer for the seller needs to be aware of. The first point is this, there is an obligation to disclose latent defects. So if you identify that there is a problem or something that the buyer would not be aware of, there is in my view, an obligation to disclose its existence. I would want my client's authority to disclose it, but I would tell my seller client, if we fail to disclose it, then we are potentially liable for breach of contract. I am concerned about client confidentiality issues and disclosing defects in title um, without client's permission or authority. So I'd get my client's permission before I say anything to the other side. But with regard to latent defects, on slide I mentioned the sorts of things that can cause problems. The first problem is that there may be documents that are referred to in the official copies of the register or referred to elsewhere that in fact the seller can't produce. The buyer is not going to be aware of that fact until it is disclosed by the seller. So such an inability to produce or provide a document would be a latent defect. Implied easements, easements of necessity, easements of intention are latent defects or latent issues that should be disclosed to the buyer, as are prescriptive easements. And so are homes rights. I was just talking to someone this morning about homes rights, and there's an interesting question. 
as far as a home's right is concerned, a home's right is sig simply a signification that someone has the benefit of a right to occupy a matrimonial home or a home owned by a partner, a civil partner. There isn't a requirement for a home's rights notice to be placed on the title for a home's rights to be binding on the buyer. It is the occupation by the spouse or civil partner that gives rights to the home's rights. The right is a right of occupation and significantly, you may not be aware of this, but home's rights can be extended by court order. So normally a matrimonial home's right in connection with a marital relationship would end on decree absolute. It is possible for the court to extend the scope of the home's right so it goes beyond that. All of these things are latent defects that the seller's conveyancer needs to think about and needs to potentially disclose either within the contract and the section head of latent encumbrance or elsewhere. Overriding interests have the possibility to be latent defects. Not all of them are. Someone in actual occupation of the property, a tenant in occupation of the property, wouldn't necessarily be a latent overriding interest, but it could be if the person, if the right, was not obvious on inspection. So if you had a situation where part of the property was let to a commercial tenant, but the commercial tenant was not in occupation currently while the property is being marketed, that tenancy would be a latent defect, unless, of course, the lease was noted or registered at the land registry. So a seller's perspective, we do have to think about identifying latent defects and disclosing them. So if we have a latent defect or if we have a defect in our title, should we disclose the defect in title to the buyer? Well, I think the conveyancing protocol suggests that we should. It promotes transparency. It promotes communication. It promotes honesty. And therefore, subject to getting clients' authority, I think we should disclose the problem to the buyer. Which then leads me to a question of should the seller take out the policy? And my reaction has always been, no, the seller shouldn't do that. And Robert, if I can introduce you at this point in time. We've discussed in the past this issue, I know, and I'd welcome your view. Uh, given the amount of uh, policies that you see and the work that you do with Stuart Title, could you ever envisage a situation where it would be prudent for the seller to take out the policy rather than a buyer? Thank you, Ian. Um, I think it's always dangerous. I mean, it always has been dangerous for a buyer, for a seller to purchase a policy. But I think, especially since the IDD, it throws up some important problems regarding reporting on the policy to the buyer. And I think if a seller were to, seller solicitor were to buy a policy on behalf of the buyer, they would need to explain the policy and would be liable for that information given. They would be the insurance mediator there. So yeah. I think more so than ever, as a seller solicitor, uh, you should offer uh, an apportionment to cover the cost. I think your point yeah. initially about seeing what's available in the market is very useful. If you identify mm -hmm. a problem when you're investigating title, see what's available. Uh, products like our Stuart Online solution, you can get uh, without logging in, so you don't even need to be a user of it, you can get a quote there within a few seconds. If you do log in, you can get a draft policy in 90 seconds. You're not committed to it, but it could be quite useful be able to put that in your title bundle when you have a buyer and say to them there is a problem here is a specimen policy that covered so um you know, it, it it would help to round out the, the problem there for people so i would i would refrain from buying it but showing what's available i think could be a useful tool for you yeah <laughs> thanks for that robert i think the other interesting thing that's interesting there is that if the seller did take out the policy he or she is then creating an issue for the buyer and the buyer is then required to perform a due diligence exercise with regard to the existence of the policy. 
and make inquiry of the insurer or asking for warranties from the seller as to what they said to the insurer when the policy was taken out. So I'm glad you agree with me that the sensible course of action is from the seller's perspective to say, hey, there is a problem, but I've got a solution and here it is and here's what it's going to cost. That makes sort of perfect sense. One of the things that worries me, however, with regard to this issue is the pre-existing policy. And again, Robert, you and I have spoken in the past about auction sales <coughs> and pre-existing policies. And I think it's worth explaining to delegates the vulnerability, <coughs> excuse me, if I'm acting for a seller and I'm selling a property with a defect in title or with a pre-existing policy. Because I think I'm right in saying that a disclosure to anyone other than a bona fide buyer in a standard conveyancing transaction has the potential to be a disclosure to the world at large. Is that right? Yeah, that's entirely the case, Ian. Um, any disclosure other than to a bona fide purchase, as you say, which we would yeah. take normally to be somebody who has made an offer on a property which has been accepted and instructed solicitors, um, any disclosure other than to those sorts of people is a disclosure which could cause the policy to be voidable. Um, and that is important to remember in insurance packs, theoretically, any member of the public can go along and ask for that insurance pack. Or if you have mm -hmm. uh, documents there for people to inspect, that's available there. It even goes to the extent of if you've included replies to TA inquiries as part of the auction pack. And you mentioned in yeah. there, there is the policy. Potentially, that is a um, disclosure. We have, uh, you can always apply to the insurer and ask for permission to disclose it, um, which may yeah. be given or may not. We have in the past, when working with solicitors, have asked what to do in that situation, uh, agreed that a reply such as there is a problem, there is a covenant that affects development, uh, but a policy will be available at completion is in a yeah. rather nice legal way, not telling you there is a policy, uh, but explaining one will be available at completion. So that's, I think, the way to go there. It is very important to remember yes. uh, insurers are, are generally quite paranoid and do believe that your neighbours will go and look at uh, the insurance bundle if they see your house is on the market. Yeah. So uh, yeah. it may be possible, but it could be a danger for you in the future. Yeah, I mean, you make a good point there, Robert, that uh, you know, talking to the insurer before you do anything has to be a sensible course. But if in doubt, don't disclose the defect, don't disclose the policy, has to be the safest course in yeah. uh, most cases. Yeah. I think, Robert, the other thing is, with online auctions in particular, it's even worse, isn't it? Because, you, you know, at least in an auction room, you might have a, a register of people that are in attendance, so you know who's there. But with an online auction, you know, anyone at any time, day or night, can access the auction back and see what there is. So it's not just the sort of the, the neighbor that turns up at the auction, but anyone potentially could see, you know, worldwide what uh, is being sold. And that, of course, creates far greater problems. Thanks for that, Robert. That's, that's, that's great. In addition to this issue of non disclosure, we also have to think about the seller being liable for misrepresentation. And again, here, the important point is to warn the seller client about the dangers of misrepresentation. Making a false statement of fact or law that induces a buyer to enter into the contract with the buyer sustaining loss as a consequence. So the obvious thing for a seller to misrepresent the position with regard to a property being sold is within the TA forms. But there are other situations where misrepresentations could be made, notably when buyer and seller are talking as the property is inspected, exchanges of correspondence between parties, exchanges of correspondence between agents representing parties, and of course exchanges of correspondence or emails between conveyances. So the client has to be aware of the vulnerability of misrepresentation, as does any advisor assisting or representing the seller. Important point, a seller can be liable for failing to remedy an, an incorrect position. So if a TA form reply 
changes during the life of a transaction before exchange, it is incumbent on the seller to disclose the change and make sure that the buyer is aware of it. But generally speaking, silence isn't a misrepresentation. So if a question is asked and not responded to, that generally is not a misrepresentation. A number of points really, I think, flowing on from those general points relating to misrep. Point number one, it can be quite difficult for a buyer to establish misrepresentation because statements might have been made, disclosures might have been made in the TA forms, but the seller at the end, sorry, but the buyer at the end of the day is going to be relying on survey and valuation, own inspection, and the due diligence processes undertaken by the buyer's conveyancer. So sometimes it can be quite difficult for a buyer to say that what the seller did or didn't do or didn't say induced me into entering into the contract. When you've got a seller that isn't being uh, particularly sensible with regard to replies to inquiries or is adopting a very cavalier attitude with regard to replies in the form of T replies to TA forms, I would warn them of Section 2 of the Ford Act 2006, which creates a criminal offence for making a false representation. Significantly, unlike misrepresentation, it doesn't matter whether the buyer actually buys the property. It doesn't matter whether the buyer was induced to purchase the property as a consequence of the misrepresentation. The Fraud Act creates a, a, a criminal offence simply by making the representation itself. It doesn't matter what happens thereafter. So I wouldn't warn every client because you're going to scare the living daylights out of them. But where you've got a client that you think has a cavalier attitude or you don't trust with regard to taking the TA form seriously enough and their duties and obligations arising, it may be worth warning them about the potential for the Commission of Fraud Act offences. With regard to misrepresentation, again, it's important that the seller's conveyancer is aware of standard conditions of sale 711, which in essence limits the availability of misrepresentation. Now, I've set it out in the notes and in the slide, but I'll just read it out to you. 711A states, where there is a material difference between the description or value of the property or any of the contents included in the contract as represented, and it is, the buyer is entitled to damages. And an error or omission only entitles the buyer to rescind the contract where it results from fraud or recklessness, so that's excluding innocent misrepresentation, or where the buyer would be obliged to his prejudice to accept property altering or differing substantially in quantity, quality or tenure from what the error or omission had led him to expect. So 711 limits the extent to which a misrepresentation claim is going to flow, or I suppose more accurately limits the remedies that are available where misrepresentation occurs. From a seller's perspective, the seller needs to be aware that they could be liable for misrepresentation that in circumstances of fraud or recklessness could enable the buyer to walk away from the contract or where there isn't fraud or recklessness but diminution in value of a substantial nature, the buyer could bring a proceedings for damages and the damages being the difference in value between what was represented to them and what they actually got. From a buyer's perspective, as we'll see, I would always warn a client that although technically there is a right to bring a claim for misrepresentation, the reality will be that the buyer client will not have the appetite or the financial resources or the willingness to take risk to pursue such a claim. In addition to misrepresentation, a seller can be liable for misdescription. Fortunately, or unfortunately, depending on your stance, Misdescription will, generally speaking, arise due to an error in connection with drafting the contract because it is limited to an overstatement as to the extent of the land, the physical extent of the land being sold, or an incorrect description of tenure. So you're unlikely to see a seller volunteering information that generates a vulnerability to misdescription you are really looking at a defective contract. And where you're looking at a defective contract, unfortunately, you're looking at potentially a claim against the conveyancer that's drafted the contract. So misdescription claims are relatively rare. 
and they invariably will involve some form of professional negligence claim flowing in one way, shape or form if the seller is liable to the buyer for misdescription. So fortunately, you don't see a lot of it. It's important, however, that you are careful when drafting a contract to make sure that what you're stating with regard to the description of the property is accurate and that the tenure that you're describing is accurate too. Invariably, a misdescription action will arise with regard to size of plot rather than a lawyer getting the tenure incorrectly stated in the contract. I've had some pretty bad days in the office over the years, but I've never drafted a contract and I've said a property is leasehold when it's freehold or vice versa. In the notes, I've given you this case of Thorpe against Abbott, which is a 2015 decision. And in the notes, I go into the case in quite a lot of detail. There are lots of other cases that I could have utilized instead of this one, but it's an interesting case that highlights a number of things. Firstly, a seller is only obliged to answer the question that's posed directly. There's no need to provide opinions or conjecture or speculation about the question that's posed. It is simply a direct response to what you're being asked. However, there is a requirement for a provision of a frank and honest reply to the questions. So you can't sort of put a gloss or look at uh, a situation with rose-colored spectacles and provide your viewpoint to the buyer. You've got to tell the buyer how it is. And there is no expectation that a seller will seek legal advice before answering questions. So if uh, a seller provides a response to a question, the assumption is that this is an honest response that is being generated by the seller without taking any form of legal advice whatsoever. So Thorpe and Abbott's is quite an interesting case. When you look at it, you can see the court saying, well, you know, we've got to be sensible and realistic about who's providing these replies. They're not commercial inquiries before contract. There isn't an expectation that conveyancer is sitting down with the client and completing these forms. There's an expectation that the seller client is completing these forms on the kitchen table or dining room table of an evening without anyone sitting there providing any legal guidance as to what they should or shouldn't say. As far as the contract bundle is concerned, number of issues from a seller's perspective. Drafting the contract is a relatively simple exercise other than on a sale apart, which we'll come to. Downloading the official copies of the register is a relatively simple exercise and administrative task. However, it is imperative that the seller does audit the title for the reasons that Robert and I were discussing a little earlier. If there is a defect in title, far better to become aware of it, come up with some solutions related to it, and offer the defect and solutions to the buyer's conveyancer, then missing the issue, having the buyer's conveyancer come at us, having perused the contract bundle and performed due diligence and said there's a problem. I'd rather know that the buyer is going to back out as soon as I possibly can in the transaction, rather than waiting with my fingers crossed that the buyer's conveyancer doesn't spot the problem. Because all things being equal, the buyer's conveyancer will spot the problem. And even if they don't, and even if the buyer buys with a defect that they're not aware of, on subsequent sale or remortgage, they may well become aware of it, and the problem then comes back to us potentially. So better, in my view, to be upfront and to disclose the issues with the contract or with the title and performing due diligence relevant to the title, I think, is a useful exercise. I call it a seller's audit. And in doing that audit, one of the things we've got to look out for are documents that are referred to in the official copies of the register. They have to be disclosed in the contract. If they're not disclosed or incapable of being disclosed, they are an encumbrance that should be referred to in the contract. With regard to the TA forms, as I've mentioned already, a seller's conveyance task is simply to look at what the seller has said and check it against the file, and the information and data that the seller's conveyancer has on file. And of course, the contract bundle will incorporate and include the documents, EPCs, guarantees, and in leasehold transactions, a whole raft 
of additional documentation. Better that that documentation is collated and the contract bundle sent in one hit, but understandable in certain circumstances that the bundle is partly completed. In those circumstances, the seller should advise the buyer which documents are not included and when it is envisaged that those documents will be available. As far as the contract is concerned, two or three points really that I think need mentioning. Firstly, from a seller's perspective, if I've got a dependent uh, purchase, then I need to think about altering the time, latest time for completion from 2 p.m. to a time that is sooner. Where I am already insuring the property, I may want to put a special condition in the contract stating that my insurance will continue, not as per the standard conditions compelling the buyer to insure from exchange. I need to think about the addition of the TA10 form to the contract and a price apportionment. The parties to the contract should sign the contract in the so should sign the TA form in those circumstances, and it should be annexed to the contract. If the property is being sold subject to tenancy or persons in occupation, then they should be party to the contract. And where that party is vacating, there is an appropriate special condition that requires inserting. The drafting of the contract is a relatively simple task and a simple exercise, but it is important that the seller's conveyancer understands that there may be special conditions that would be appropriate, and certainly on sales of part, great care must be exercised with regard to special conditions dealing with sin, things such as easements, things such as restrictive covenants, etc., which we'll come to in a moment or two. The TA forms I've covered off already, but on the slide there, I've given you the warnings that are contained in form TA6, which highlight the point that I make about this is the seller's own work and the seller is not seeking advice or assistance from a conveyancer. They should be completed by the seller, they should be truthful and accurate, and sellers need to be aware of liability for error and liability or duty to notify you and for you to notify buyer of changes. So that's a fairly straightforward set of circumstances with regard to the TA forms. Form TA 10, again, from a seller's perspective, we may be seeing a buyer asking for warranties with regard to electrical items or other equipment that is included as part of the contents, in addition to the point that I made about checking that where there is an apportionment which impacts on SDLT liability, there is evidence to justify the apportionment and the price being paid for contents. Make sure that the seller checks the TA form and confirms TA 10 form and confirms its accuracy and do be alive to the fact that the buyer may be asking for a special condition in the contract relating to warranties as to state and condition of items included in the sale. Other documentation I've listed. From a seller's perspective, we might have a change of name in connection with registered proprietor. We might have guarantees and reports that have been obtained with regard to the transaction. And we may have other documentation that is relevant to the transaction that should be included in the contract bundle. Again, if there's anything that's of sort of real consequence, so we're not sure about the validity of a guarantee, or we're not sure where a report makes reference to other reports or documentation, it is prudent to ask the seller for clarification and to ask for the additional documents. Again, rather than waiting for the buyer to spot that there's an omission and to uh, make a request for that document or documents. In unregistered land, if we're acting for a seller, we need, of course, our title, our epitome of title, as far as that is concerned, again, I would always do an audit of the unregistered deeds and documents to see what I've got and what I haven't got and produce an epitome of title, which would include land charges searches against former estate owners for their period of ownership. It would also include things like certified copies of grants of probate, powers of attorney, etc. One or two things to be careful with regard to unregistered land make sure that plans are properly copied and documents containing plans have plans that are properly colored. Make sure 
that you are comfortable and happy that the buyer is going to be satisfied with the title that you're offering and that the land registry on first registration is going to be satisfied as well. And here's a tip that I think is important when acting in unregistered land on behalf of a seller. It might be prudent where there are issues or problems or perceived problems with regard to the title to voluntarily register the unregistered land rather than sell an unregistered title. If nothing else, there are some practical advantages in adopting that approach. An application for first registration these days can take anything up to about 13, 14 months to be dealt with by the land registry. Applications for voluntary registration seem to be significantly swifter. Where, as a seller, I'm concerned about sales apart or issues with regard to boundaries, etc., or I've got a title that composed, is composed of part of registered land, part unregistered land, I might do a SIM search just to see if I can clarify that what I'm selling is uh, what I've got with regard to title. And again, just identifying if there are any potential problems relating to the title. And it might be that that SIM search is included in the contract bundle. From a buyer's perspective, as we'll see, I would advocate a SIM search is done whenever we're acquiring unregistered land and also whenever we're acquiring complex registered title. And just as a word of warning, again, for buyers, and we'll talk about this in a future webinar, but do watch. There are some lenders that will not lend on a property that's composed of more than one registered title. The reason for that is some issues with regard to land registry title plans that you may, may, may or may not be familiar with. The point being, that title plans may not be accurate and therefore what appears on the ground to be two titles that have put one another is not the case when you actually look at the registered titles or the description of the titles. Can a buyer raise additional inquiries? The answer is yes, but the buyer should not be raising general inquiries, they should be specific inquiries relevant to the contract bundle or to the title that's been disclosed to them. Again, far better to be full and frank with regard to disclosure at the start of the transaction rather than hiding a problem or hoping that a buyer or a buyer's conveyance fails to spot it. So I would always proceed, subject to what I've said about making sure the seller client approves what I'm doing, I would always disclose the problem with, as we mentioned earlier, the solution if that's available. I said we'd talk for a little bit about sales apart, and sales apart cause negligence claims. Why? Firstly, there is a requirement for a plan, and a professionally prepared plan that is Land Registry Practice Guide 40 compliant. Just recently been doing some work with regard to problems and issues in connection with first tier tribunal applications involving land registration. And in doing that exercise, I came across a case called WIT against Woodhead. And in this case, there was a determined boundary dispute that ended up before a first-tier tribunal. And the judge, the county court judge that was sitting as the chair of the tribunal, in essence was attempting to identify where a legal boundary sat between two properties. And the area of land that was disputed by the two parties was literally millimetres in width. And a chartered land surveyor had pegged the site out, put stakes in where he thought the boundary was. And the problem with the stakes is that the parties were still in disagreement because one party was saying the boundary is the western side of the stake and the other party was saying it was the eastern size side of the stake, the width of the stake being, I think it was five or six centimetres. So again, it just shows you the ridiculous problems that can arise with regard to plants. And it can also show you that a boundary line is, in essence, a pencil-thin line separating my title from your title. So with regard to a plan, if we've got uh, complex boundary issues, then we want plans with the greatest scale as possible, probably reference to national grid coordinates, certainly reference to measurement, and ideally, reference to physical features that are going to have a permanent presence on site going forward. The next thing we need to think about are easements that are being granted in favour of the land that we're selling. 
and something that is frequently overlooked, the need to think about easements that are going to be reserved for the retained land. We also need to think these days about the use of rent charges where there's sort of common access or common drains, etc., as between properties. And of course, we do need to think about the imposition of restrictive covenants to protect the land that is being retained. Significantly with regard to that point, I would always ensure that whenever you're selling land off, and no matter what the purpose, that you advise a seller client about the prudence in imposing restrictive covenants. Robert and I have talked about this on a number of occasions in the past. The relaxation of the planning regime, and I'm pleased to see that the proposed relaxation has been put on hold, and I think the government is having a review. But the proposed reform of planning and the relaxation of planning means that the use of restrictive covenants is going to become more and more significant in the future. And therefore, it is important that we're advising clients about their use. And again, it's important that we understand and appreciate that the restrictive covenant needs to be enforceable. And therefore, we need to revise the rules in Tuk and Moxhay and make sure that we're compliant with them. I was talking to someone this week about uh, restrictive covenants and just highlighting the point that just because a restrictive covenant is noted on a title does not in fact mean that the restrictive covenant is enforceable. And therefore, when acting for a seller, it's important that we do ensure the restrictive covenant is noted on the title that is being sold off. And also we ensure that sitting behind the registration of the covenant and protection of the covenant, we are satisfied that it is in fact enforceable. Other issues that I think are important, evidence of title we've covered off. Uh, again, important, as Robert mentioned earlier, this idea about being aware of defect, advising buyer of defect, suggesting solution via policy, and as Robert quite correctly mentioned, Go to Stuart Title Online and you can see the policies that are there, that are available, and see the level of premium that's required. So rather than handing the prospective buyer and its conveyance or a problem, you're handing the buyer the problem with the solution. As far as apportionment of purchase price is concerned when drafting a contract, be careful. HMRC are not manned sufficiently to enable them to look at a lot of conveyancing transactions and SDLT liability arising, but they can look and do look, and theoretically they can look indefinitely if they suspect fraud at historical transactions to determine whether or not, for example, an apportionment is reasonable. If you're acting for a seller, be careful when advising in connection with deposits. If you're drafting a contract and allowing the buyer to pay a 10% deposit, all well and good. However, if the client, agent, or indeed ourselves are negotiating the fact the buyer pays a reduced deposit, we need to be warning our seller client that if the buyer defaults, then the seller theoretically would have to sue if the buyer was reluctant or unwilling to pay the remainder of the deposit due at completion. Again, you know, just think about it logically. If I'm a buyer, and I can't proceed to complete, I've paid a 5% deposit. Do you really think that on the day of completion, when I'm sitting there all forlorn on the basis that I'm in there, unable to complete the transaction, I'm going to get my checkbook out or send a bank transfer to my solicitors for the remaining 5% of the deposit that's due to the seller? The reality is, OK, I'm going to disappear into the bushes and hide. And the reality is likely that your client seller is going to have to sue me for the remaining deposit or wave it goodbye. And the other point is with regard to deposits, watch if your client is buying up market and there is a defaulting buyer on a sale, we can retain the deposit that the defaulting buyer has paid, but we might be liable to lose our deposit on our dependent purchase, which could cause us problems. And watch out for conditional contracts. Conditional contracts are a nightmare. If you are imposing conditions on a contract, be specific as to what the condition is. Where a condition is vague or ambiguous, satisfactory searches 
satisfactory mortgage offer, satisfactory defective title insurance policy, a court is going to say, well, that's vague or ambiguous. I can't determine what a satisfactory defective title insurance policy is, meaning that the exchange of contract is unconditional. What I want to do now is just summarise some good habits, and there are more than 10. One, onboarding clients. Check identity, but be aware of identity throughout. Two, do an audit of the title at the start and make sure if there are problems or defects, they're disclosed to the seller client. The review is taken. The view and the advice should be that the problem should be disclosed to the buyer as soon as possible in the life of the transaction. Where a defective title insurance policy is going to produce a magic fix, check that the policy is available, highlight to the buyer the existence of the policy and the premium that's to be paid. The seller should be paying the premium, so there should be a price apportionment. A buyer needs to be careful about warranting, sorry, warranting, requiring a seller to take out the policy for the reasons that Robert, Robert and I discussed a little earlier. Where there are pre-existing policies that are still going to exist on acquisition, from a buyer's perspective, it is important to perform due diligence with regard to the existence of that policy to check that it meets clients needs and will meet any loss that the client buyer could potentially sustain when producing ta forms to our seller client make sure the seller client understands their duties and responsibilities make sure that you understand your duties and responsibilities with regard to advising the seller client relating to the completion of the forms Preparing a contract should be a relatively simple exercise. Watch out for latent encumbrances, watch out for price apportionments, and watch out for how the deposit is to be dealt with. Nothing wrong with a buyer raising additional inquiries as long as they are pertinent to the documents that have been disclosed or omitted. Latent defects that require disclosing, homes rights notices, prescriptive easements, implied easements, certain types of overriding interest. And again, important that we understand that these need to be disclosed. And frequently, it will be the seller client that's telling us about them. They are not, by their very nature, going to be evident from the title. So when we've audited the title, we should be asking the seller about whether there are any circumstances, situations, that potentially could generate a latent encumbrance that would need to be disclosed to the buyer during the conveyancing process. In connection with the conveyancing process, the ethos is always just do the simple things well. On that note, Robert, is there anything else that you would like to add with regard to this presentation? I am conscious of the fact that here we're looking at things from a seller's perspective, and really, it's from the buyer's perspective that issues relating to the taking out of a defective title insurance policy become significant. But is there anything that we've missed or anything that would warrant further comment or investigation? I think the only point is you talked about supporting documentation as part of your pack, and you did refer at the yeah. end to title policies. I think it is essential that uh, if you identify a problem, First point is to see whether there's already an existing policy within your title deeds. Uh, bear in mind, it would have been taken out some time ago, but uh, many insurers, uh, like Stuart Title, have indexation in the policies. So our policies all carry 10% per year for the first 10 years. So you could find that the cover has gone up in line with the increase in value of the property. So there you've got a policy already. You don't need to go through the process uh, of uh, getting a new one. That's there. If you have a policy where the level of indemnity isn't sufficient, probably the easiest way is to go to that insurer and see about getting an endorsement to increase the level of cover. The cover, that's got to be yeah. the quicker thing for you there. Um, and then also just to uh, think about uh, what else there is there, what you can do. If you're unhappy with the policy, uh, you can look to another insurer 
provide a new policy. There may be some reasons there, but always check the policy uh, to make sure it does cover the problem still. Um, you would need to be uh, in the same way that you would be doing due diligence when being offered the policy before offering it uh, to someone. Just make sure the information is the same, haven't been any changes in circumstances that would make the policy difficult to enforce. So it is uh, sometimes title policies get sort of tucked away. Back in the old days, they get tucked on the file and forgotten about. Nowadays, they're quite often sent to the client. But I think it is important when doing that to remind the client this could be an important part of their title for the future and to store it appropriately because uh, it could help short circuit the process of uh, taking a defective title to a good one fairly easily. Yeah, actually, Robert, you make a great point there. So if, if I'm a seller's conveyancer doing an audit of my title and I spot a defect, one of the things I should be saying to my seller client is when you bought this, your buyer, your solicitors might have been aware of it and there may be a policy. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Point. It should be there. It's like all it's like all titled documents, really. It should be on your tick list just to make sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Okay. Lovely. Thank you, Robert. And thank you very much for your assistance today. I hope that webinar has been of use and of interest. If you are interested in any Stuart Title insurance products, then please contact Robert and his colleagues at Stuart Title. And if you have any questions relevant to what I've said or not said today, then do feel free to drop me a note via my email address. But on behalf of IQ Legal Training and on behalf of Stuart Title, thank you very much indeed for attending today, for listening and giving up your valuable time. It's appreciated by me and I'm sure it's appreciated by Stuart Title as well. Thank you very much.